nature of knowledge. It's a social science based uh, model. And uh, I come to the realization that basically the social sciences uh, is really the lens or the frame in which you want to analyze the markets and analyze you know, how things are done within the world. And you really do, it's a, uh, it's a multi-institutional model. Basically each discipline, particularly in the business school and in the social science school, in my view, is a toolbox that has tools in it to be able to solve extremely complex uh, problems. The question is, do you know what toolbox to go to and what tools you'll need to be able to pull out to be able to solve the problems very quickly? And the problem, the problem that you're trying to solve is what is the value of equity? Is the value of equity going to go up or down? That's basically it. Uh, because if you can forecast where the value of equity is going to go, particularly your human capital and your human equity or the equity in your stock portfolio or the equity in your real estate, you can place and make decisions and make investment decisions um, that are going to allow you to outperform over your lifetime, but also mitigate, mitigate any loss or damage that may come due to outside influences. So really what I did was I set it up as a uh, multiple regression equation where each individual discipline is a multiple regression equation and then I stack them on top of each other and there are variables in one model that are also in the other. So if taxes go up, the value of equity is going to go down. If taxes go down, the value goes up. If interest rates go down, the value goes up. If interest rates go up, the value goes down. That's just an example of variables in, in some of these models. But the, to solve the value of the equity equation, you got to stack these equations on top of each other and they need to be solved simultaneously. So it's a simultaneous multiple regression solution. When I developed this model in 1996, there was no big data, and data processing was still in its infancy. Today, there's infinite storage through cloud computing, <coughs> and you have 25,000 times the computing processing capabilities now than what we had in 1996 when it was developed. So <coughs> the models, the institution, the, the equations, the equations themselves are extremely complex individually. Each equation in the social sciences has 50 variables in them. In the physical sciences, if you're studying physics or, or chemistry, the laws of nature basically hold, and you end up using maybe five variables or less in your equation. But in social sciences, you have 50 variables in each equation, and you have 11 equations. So you have an 11 by 50 factorial, which means that it's extremely complex and data processing intensive and storage intensive solution that you need to solve. But how do you solve it? Well, you can solve it. You have the most powerful supercomputer sitting on your shoulders right now. The human brain is the most powerful supercomputer ever designed. It is a biological system that can transact trillion transactions a day. A trillion. You transact a trillion biological transactions in your brain every single day. So you have the power to be able to solve the simultaneous equation solution in your brain right now. You enable the computations through technology. Now you are the most powerful generation ever on earth. You have basically supercomputing uh, capabilities in your phone right now. You couple that with laptops and tablets and uh, social media access. You are the most powerful generation on earth. And that's gonna, that means that you have accountability and responsibility because of the power that you have. The question is, do you recognize the power that you have? Do you understand the model? And do you understand how, how powerful you are? You probably don't until I just told you. So you've got to understand these models. You've got to understand these institutions. You have to understand accounting. You've got to understand the managerial and the financial accounting because that's basically the basis for everything. Government, nonprofits, corporations, private companies, public companies. You've got to have the accounting. You've got to understand the accounting. You've got to roll up the accounting into financial ratios to be able to then benchmark and take those financial ratios and those performance reports to the VCs, to the banks, uh, to the uh, public and the private capital markets to be able to raise the capital that you need to be able to grow your firm 
and provide not only the working capital, but the investment capital that you need to be able to maximize the profits within the company. You gotta understand the finance and the ability to not only do the valuations, but access the public markets or the private markets, because you're gonna need to be able to access those markets, again, to raise the capital to finance the assets within the firm. You have to understand the economic environments in which you exist. Each country has a different political, economic environment in which companies and individuals exist in. Do you understand the economic ideologies that basically govern uh, this economy and this society? Do you understand monetary policy and fiscal policies and the impacts of monetary and fiscal policy, not only on your own human capital and wealth, but on the human capital and the wealth of society in general within the United States in <coughs> global? Do you understand that political science basically determines policy and policy formation? Policy formation can be done by the populace. They can bring uh, needs and demands to their governors, their government and legislative bodies to then formulate the policy, reconcile it, and have it be signed by the president and put into law. Once these laws are put into place, the public, the public administration and the bureaucracy administer those policies with intended and unintended outcomes. The question is, do you even understand that and understand that these policies will have a direct and, impact, direct and indirect impact on you and your family and your companies and your portfolio and your real estate and everything? Do you even understand that? Our legal, political, and economic system is basically designed in a Western philosophical uh, manner. We basically took from the European model, adopted it, and basically made it, modified it to make it more effective. Do you understand the philosophical frames in which our society exists? Do you understand who Jean Jacques Rousseau and John Stuart Mills and Immanuel Kant and, and other philosophers and how they designed the system basically to, to interact and act and govern society in a civil society and a legal system based on precedent and legal philosophies, again, that basically determine outcomes and decisions that are made that have permanent impacts individuals. And if you go back and you look you know, at the structure in which our society is governed, it's basically a derivative of theological systems that were designed three to 5,000 years ago. It looks exactly the same, it's just a little bit different. So basically our society, the society in which you exist in, it goes back 5,000 years, 2,000 years. Do you even understand that? So the key is First is understanding that all of these models are interrelated. There's variables in one that are in the other. At the end of the day, it's your decision to be able to process this information, collect as much data as you can. You have infinite storage in your brain. You have infinite capabilities in data processing. And you understand that you collect the data, you process it, and you make a decision, and knowing that the decision that you're making is correct, and you can be decisive in your decision making. And the way that, that, that makes this all work and the analysis actually work is because we are in a society that basically allows and is conducive to knowledge and information. You cannot apply this model in Aleppo. You cannot apply this model in Baghdad. You cannot apply this model in Lebanon because the social and institutional environment is destroyed. It is failed completely. So you do not have a, a civilization. We can do it here, okay? And you, you all, we all are extremely lucky to be here because this model can work here. And what keeps it all together is linguistics. Linguistics and language, we speak in English, which is basically the global language for business. We can communicate on a daily basis with individuals and now with enabling technologies, we can communicate instantaneously with groups of individuals never before done before we do it in English. And just the language itself is an extremely complex skill set. For you to be able to communicate every single day, which you probably take advantage of, is an extremely highly complex uh, skill set that takes trillions of transactions biologically to be able to command and to be able to communicate. And now you have telecommunications and technology that enable you to communicate more quickly <coughs> with more people quicker. Never before done and the last is really the, uh, the reflection of, the, of civilization and the civil society, I believe, is really architecture. It's 
just look around you at the architecture here. It's gorgeous. If you go down to San Francisco and you look at the, a lot of these major buildings and you go downtown, they're beautiful. You go any place in the world, that major city, beautiful architecture. It's a reflection of civilization and its ability to, to basically live in peace uh, within a society. So the major takeaway here is uh, it's a machine language. It's basically how the world works. It's a social science-based model. It's a complex system of institutions and equations. There are variables in one equation that are also in the other. It's multi-institutional. It's a simultaneous equation solution. It's based on multiple regression and big data. And lastly, it's biological processing with infinite storage and uh, rapid uh, data processing capabilities based on your brain. The second uh, model is when you go talk to people, and you're going to be talking to a lot of people because you're getting ready. You're, you're juniors. You're going to be starting internships. You're going to be getting jobs. You're going to be working, moving into the workforce. Okay? And you need to understand where these people are coming from. When you talk to these people, when you start talking to clients, and you start talking to people at different levels of the organization, you've got to be able to modify your ability to communicate with these people. You've got to know where they are coming from. And you've got to know where you're coming from. And you're probably going to enter down here in the virtual organic realm of the organization structure. And you're probably going to be working in teams based across different functions of the organization. So you need to understand where you come in to the organization and what the uh, dynamics are, both psychologically and, and structurally uh, within the teams and within the area that you're coming in within the organization. You're going to be having conversations not only across functions, but also <coughs> up the lines within the organization. Do you understand who you're talking to, who the person is, what their roles and responsibilities and accountabilities, their title, where did they come from, what school did they, did they go to, where did they live, do they have a family, are they single? All those factors are going to be taken into consideration when you're communicating with these people. So you've got to be able to communicate not only laterally, but also vertically within the organization. But the important part about understanding this is you have to plot out your mobility. You, gotta pro, pro, you have to plot out where you're going to go. Are you going to stay down here over the next 20, 30 years? Or do you have aspirations to move up within the organization? Do you understand when the organization becomes myopic and basically you have to leave the organization? Or maybe you come to the realization that you've hit a glass ceiling within the organization and there's no upward mobility. So you have to leave the organization to arbitrage your human capital by going outside the corporation and going someplace else. You have to understand the organizational structure within the company, and you have to be able to communicate to people across the different functions and, and up, up the lines. Can you have conversations with the CEO, CFO, and the chairman of the board? Can you have conversations with the executive vice presidents and the managing directors that are running the divisions or the product lines within the organization? extremely important that you understand how to communicate, but also how to plot and navigate your future within the organizational structure. So the major takeaway here is first thing you got to do before you walk into an organization and when you start talking to people is you have to do an organizational scan of the organization. You have to understand the organizational design of the company or the organization, organization within the industry and its phase of development. What comparative advantages and disadvantages uh, does the company have or the organization? You have to determine your location and you have to determine the value that you add within the division, within the organization on a constant basis if you want to arbitrage your human capital. And you have to understand how to navigate and arbitrage the human capital. How do, you, how do you build human capital for yourself and within the organization? Do you understand when you go to work at these companies that you are accumulating experience and knowledge, which is an accumulation of human capital? You also have to be willing to move, and you gotta be, you got to be able to execute within these organizations. You have to be able to communicate not only vertically, but also horizontally within the organization. And if you see that there is an opportunity in front of you, either within the organization or outside the organization, you got to take it, you got to move, and you got to be decisive about it. If you stay, you will become myopic, and you may end up making a huge mistake.
So how do you do it? How do you become extremely successful? Um, you have to plan. You need a plan. You can't be reactive because you'll be manipulated by people around you. You have to plan. You have to have a strategic plan, tactical plan, and an operating plan. You have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you're going to be reacting to outside influence without any kind of structure. So what is the plan? Well, I put together a 20-year plan. And basically, it lays out like this. Well, first, you have to understand what your priorities are and what you're willing to sacrifice if you want upward mobility, if you want to be an executive, if you want to run your own company. You have to understand what your priorities are and what you're willing and unwilling to sacrifice. Um, we have a lot of uh, competition um, for, for us, for our interests, for our time. Uh, as we start trying to move up uh, within the world. Uh, we have family commitments. You know, have to have friends or sports or music or a job or school or other commitments. What are you willing to give up? What are you not willing to give up? And that's basically going to set the constraints and the opportunities for you to go forward. The first thing you need is the bachelor's degree. It's basically the ticket to get into the baseball game. But the goal is to become a player on the, on the baseball field. But the bachelor's degree is just a ticket to get into the game. And depending on who you are and where you go to school and what your opportunities are, it could take between four and seven years to get through the undergrad program. Once you get the ticket into the ball game, you're basically within a, a, an apprentice program or an intermediate period that could last three to five to maybe seven years. At this point in time, you're accumulating certifications licensing and experience, because what you're trying to do is to set yourself up to go do, a, go do an Ivy League MBA, or go to a law, one of the top law schools in the country. You have to start planning that now. And what you have uh, going for you is you have two years as juniors. You can still turn it around if you don't, if you haven't yet, and you focus on the GPA and you focus on the experience to get into the best program in the best school that you can and don't worry about the money because it's not about the money, it's getting in. So within this time period here, this three to five to seven years, for the, for the accounting students, you're getting your CPA licensed and certification and getting your hours and getting certified and licensed. For the finance people, you're getting your CFA designation, <coughs> which takes three years. For others, you probably would need an insurance license or a real estate license. Maybe if you're going to do investment management, you're going to need a Series 7 and a 66. And if you want to manage teams of investment advisors and brokers, you're going to need a Series 24 to be able to do it. And if you want to start your own broker-dealer, you're going to need the 27 too. So there's experience and you need the licensing to be able to do this stuff, or certifications. So once you get through here and you've already plotted out where you're going to go, and this is a traditional model executive programs now and night classes, but this is the traditional. To get into the full-time MBA program, and it's not even two years, it's really just four quarters. You have the winters off and you have the summers off. But here's the deal, once you get in, you're gonna do an internship, Oracle, Cisco, Goldman Sachs, whoever, um, and you're gonna do the internship, and by the end of the internship, they're probably gonna offer you a job. So you actually have a job offer uh, right after the first year within the program. And you've probably negotiated, if you're smart, that they're going to pay for the rest of your school and they're going to buy out the loans and the debt that you accumulated to go to the program. So you, it's not about the money. It's getting in and completing the program at the top, at one of the top schools in the top programs. So you need the experience here. You need the letters of references. You need the letter of recommendations. You need the statement of purposes, and you got to get into the upper 90th percentile on the entrance exams. you got to get in the upper 90th percentile or basically ace the GMAT or the GRE or the LSAT for law school. Oh, and if you go to law school and you get in the 90th percentile of the LSAT, you have good experience, grades, and references and all that stuff, and you do pro bono work, they will pay for the whole thing. 150 grand, gone. The school will pay for your law school. You can do securities law or intellectual property law or whatever it is, they will pay for the whole thing if you can get the grades. <clears throat> so then once you get out, you're basically going to be in an associate apprentice program working underneath an EVP or managing director 
Now this is awesome. Why? Because these people are extremely mobile. Um, they usually don't stay in those positions very long because they want to get into the C-suite. So if you position yourself correctly underneath these individuals, when they leave, you get their job. Move on. Done. <clears throat> so you could spend three to five years here as an EVP MD. Some people love to just stay right here as middle management or the aspire to get into the C-suite. Now, if you get into the C-suite and you become CEO, COO, CFO, CIO, CTO, whatever the C is, you are definitely making sacrifices. You are working constantly. It's because you have a huge amount of accountability and responsibility. So you're going to have to sacrifice. You may have to sacrifice your loved ones and your families, or you're going to have to make some pretty major commitments if you're going to play it that long. So what does this mean? Well, basically, your career plan is basically a 20 to 40 year plan. I know that doesn't sound like a long time to you, but 20 to 40 years goes by really quickly. And if you make a mistake, it's extremely costly. And sometimes you can't go back. But here's really the realization of the situation. If you're 25 years old, in 20 years from now, you're 45. In 30 years, you're 55. And in 40 years, you're 65 years old. You're still young. Why is it important to understand these timelines? Well, if you make an average of $100,000 a year for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, your human capital sitting in the seat right now where you are right now, you are worth two to four million dollars. To try to replace that income over the next 20 to 40 years is worth a two to four million dollars. You are worth sitting in the seat right now between two to four million. And if you invest a thousand bucks a month for 40 years, you're going to have 4.3 million dollars in the bank. That's basically a minimum. So you are worth two to two to four million dollars right now. And here's the sad part about it: none of you probably have life insurance. So if you get sick or get Crohn's or diabetes or or you get cancer or leukemia or something happens to you, your parents get zero. Your parents invested probably a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars in you over your lifetime to get you here. And if something happens to you, they get nothing. And why is that tragic? Because a million dollars worth of life insurance would cost you 500 bucks a year to a thousand bucks. Right now, at your age, for 20 years, level premium. So it's not about the money. It's about responsibility. So the major takeaway here, uh, let me go back a little bit. Oh, I, Professor Susan, I can't afford the, uh, the MBA program. It costs 150 grand to go to Berkeley's executive or to go to Wharton or NYU or Columbia or Chicago or USC. Well, within this time period here, you're saving money. You're looking into, depending on who you are, looking into grants and scholarships. Uh, maybe you're lucky enough to have parents that will underwrite you. Uh, maybe you ha have an employer that's willing to underwrite you and or negotiate a buyout agreement once you get through the first year of the program. You can also, for you entrepreneur majors, set up a corporation, preferably a C-Corp, put in the bylaws that uh, ed uh, education and MBA is part of the compensation for senior level executives, and you can write off and deduct the tuition in the MBA program pre-tax through your C-Corporation, basically cutting in half the, uh, the, the dollar amount um, that it costs to do the MBA program. And then any gap that's, that's left over, you get bank, bank financing. And then you also negotiate with your employer that to take my bonuses, my annual bonuses, and instead of giving me half of what it is after taxes, use it as pre-tax and take out my, uh, my education. So it's not, again, it's not about the money. It's getting it. And do you realize that it takes years at least two years to be able to understand what you need to be doing right now to be able to get in. So the major takeaways is 20 to 30 years goes past. You need to plan and stay on track. Don't worry about the money. Shoot for the best school, shoot for the best program. Do not let anybody get in your way because people are gonna get in your way. Uh, a lot of people get in your way. This is what I wanna do, this is where I see myself. Well, I wouldn't do that. I can't believe you're gonna do that. Really, you're gonna do that? I would never do that. And you're going to be confronted by people who are going to get in your way, and they may even sabotage you and try to take you down during your process. So the question is, is how do you deal with people 
that are obstructing your ability to move forward decisively in your life, we basically have three options. You can tell them to go get out of the way, right? You can, you can go around them, or you can go through them. And I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times I was told, people would say, well, what are you doing? And I would tell them what I was doing, and they'd go, oh, wow, you must really like school. And it's like, yeah, I really like school. Okay. No, because when you do two undergrads and five masters and a doctorate, people think that's a little excessive. But what was I going to do? Tell them that I wanted to be a financial engineer and design financial products and indexes for financial institutions to build capital markets? They don't even understand what that means. They have no concept of what it means. But that's what I wanted to be when I was 22 years old. And I was there 10 years ago, by the time I was 45. So again, you need to go, you got to understand when people get in your, get, get in your way, you either go through them, go around them, because you got to go forward. You can't wait, and you can't be sabotaged, and you can't have people getting in your way. And that's a sacrifice that you're probably going to have to make. The next model is a psychological model, a social learning model. That was developed by Albert Bandura from Stanford University. Albert Bandura will probably uh, receive the Nobel Prize in Psychology uh, based off of his work in, in social learning and modeling and self-efficacy. This is extremely important. It's probably one of the most important components of the lecture. So through um, Bandura's work and Maslow's work and B.F. Skinner's work and other uh, psychologists' work, there is a psychological model, and it basically states that here you are right here. This is your actual self right here. This is where you are right now. Well, obviously, you don't want to stay here forever. You, want to, you have an, an ideal self <coughs> in where you see yourself and how you animate yourself moving forward. So there's a cognitive dissonance between where you are actually right now psychologically and where you want to be in the future. That cognitive dissonance is that gap. The question is, how do you narrow the gap? Well, you narrow the gap through the process of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is the process of doing and learning from your mistakes. And you look at those mistakes and those failures not as a genetic disposition, a genetic disposition, but it's a lack of information and a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of information. It's a lack of experience. So the ideal self is really going to be your target self. And again, you're going to use self-efficacy to, to narrow the gap between your ideal and your target self, I mean your actual and your target. So the way you do it is you have to identify models, other people around you, professionals, others, that, have the, that are the ideal models, that have the attributes in which you want to emulate. And you have to practice those attributes either through language or dress or interactions with people. You've identified the models, you've identified the attributes that you want to emulate, and you start to emulate them. Well, again, you're not gonna be able to do it instantaneously. It's gonna take practice, it's gonna take information, but you're gonna have to have the persistence to be able to continue moving forward towards your ideal and your target self. And at some point, that cognitive dissonance will go away. So I hear a lot of times two types of individuals, the sales and the managerial person. Oh, I'm a salesperson, I'm a managerial person, I love people, I don't like math, I don't like science, I don't like being an analyst, I'm really good at sales, I'm good at being a people person, I want to be a people person, I'm going to avoid the science and the math, and I'm going to focus on being the people person that I've identified through models that I've seen be successful as managers and salespeople, my father, my mom, my aunt, my uncle were salespeople and managers. Uh, I modeled them. I have a genetic predisposition towards sales and management. I'm going to be a sales manager and a, and a uh, marketing person, and I'm going to avoid the math and the science. Then I hear from the science and the math people, well, you know, I'm not really good with people. You know, I don't really like people that much. I'm kind of an introvert. I like doing the analysis and the mathematics. My parents and people around me were math and science people. I have a genetic predisposition towards math and science. I see the success uh, associated with that, that, that area. I'm going to continue to focus on it. 
and I'm really going to avoid the, you know, the management fee sales. Now, that's a little naive because if you look at all of the top schools and you look at the majority of the people in the top schools within the MBA programs, they're all engineers, the majority of them. And why would a science and a math person go do an MBA? Because they realize if they're going to design their own product and run their own companies, they're going to need to interact with people and raise the capital, and then they're going to need to be able to manage the company. So they, maybe they're strong here and weak here, they focus on this and they become strong here too. Because people who are strong here are also strong here, and people who are strong here are also strong here. They may have just come into it uh, through some different type of environment where they were told, which is bullshit, um, that they can't do math and science for some reason. So what they do is they work on both. The science and the math person works on the sales and management. The sales and management person works on the maths and, and scientific stuff. And they become a hybrid individual that's good at both. And you need to be good at both. And there's no way you can, you can be uh, weak at one and strong in the other. So self-efficacy is failure is not a genetic predisposition. It is a lack of information and persistence is all it is. So the outcomes associated with this are amazing. The outcomes, if you can do this and you understand this, the outcomes are amazing. And what are those outcomes? You get a persona and a very strong personality. You have a presence. When you walk into a room, people, you will command the respect of other people within that room. Because the first thing they're going to see is your dress, which is going to communicate to them your confidence and your confidence when you walk into the room. You're gonna have precise communication and language capabilities. You're gonna know exactly who you're talking to at what level, and you're gonna be using the appropriate language, language with very high precision when you, make, when you have those conversations. You will also have charisma so that people will want to follow you in your leadership role going forward. They will want to follow you, and you will have the charisma to be able to be an effective leader. You will also have the power of persuasion and power to be able to motivate people to follow you to do the things that you need them to do through your charisma and your communications. And the ultimate, the ultimate reward to this is you will become a model for other individuals. Other individuals will come up to you and want you to work for them, want you to want to work with you, will want you to take them with you in your success and your path going forward. Now the great thing it, about it is, is you will get to pick those people to take with you. The sad part is, you will also get to decide who doesn't go with you. And who you have to leave on, for some reason or another. Either because they did or said something, or because of some type of character flaw, or some kind of pathological behavior, that you, don't, you cannot afford to have them come with you, because it's too costly. It could jeopardize your career and your reputation. So how do you do all of this? You gotta have time management skills to be a highly effective individual. You gotta be constantly planning on what you're gonna do and what you're doing. First thing you need to do is to come up with a strategic plan, a one to five year plan, a five year plan that's updated every year. So you're rolling the five year plan and updating it every single year. And at your age, between 25 and, 50, 25 and 35 years old is the most important time period to make sure that you're doing the planning correctly because you're going to accelerate within that 10 year period. So you have to be completely in control of what you're doing. You have to be able to prioritize from high to low what your objectives are and what you want to accomplish in that time period. And not get too neurotic about the planning or the order of the priorities. You can always push down the priority, you can also delay it, but you will accomplish it at some point in time. I mean, I have accomplishments that I had on my strategic plan that were there for 10, 20, 30 years in some cases, but I did it, I accomplished it, I got it. It was always on the plan. I was always working towards it. So you can accomplish anything if you're persistent and focused. You have to have a tactical plan where you have a three-year plan broken down into six-month increments or quarterly. These are your goals and objectives. These are the tactics in which you're going to achieve your strategic objectives. You also need an operating plan 
where you're laying out by month key milestone dates that you need to back into and start allocating time and resources to make sure that you can meet the milestone date on time and on budget. If you don't, then you're going to delay it. If you're going to, you're going to miss these cre critical time slots, these critical dates. And then the most important is your weekly plan. And the world runs basically around this plan, so it's very standardized. Uh, Monday through Friday is a working day for me. Sunday to Saturday. Sunday, people have off around the world. You basically have open slots between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. You have to get to work between 8 and 9 and get to work by 9. Uh, you work from 9 to 12. You go to lunch from 12 to 1. You come back at 1. You work till 5. You go, do where, you go wherever you need to go, which takes about an hour. And then you basically have another slot of time between 6 and 11 or 6 and 12 at night. So to say you don't have time, you totally have time. You just haven't allocated your time correctly. And you haven't identified the key milestone dates that you need to block out time periods so that you can accomplish these things on time and on budget to be able to get things done right on time. So again, if you can do this, not only are you going to be extremely wealthy, but you're going to be extremely successful. And wealth and being able to accumulate wealth and protect your wealth is extremely important. And I'd say, I'll be honest with you, my biggest concern for you, and I am concerned for you, um, is that you don't know where the money is now. And you probably, maybe, or may not be able to accumulate enough wealth to be able to live at a standard of living in which you're accustomed to, not only for you, but your family, because you are going to be responsible for other people. But here's the concern, is you probably have grandparents and you probably have parents, okay? You probably think that you're going to be receiving some kind of dowry or some kind of wealth effect or some kind of inheritance. But I bet you, you don't even know where the money is. I bet you don't know where the money is. You've never had that conversation with your parents or your grandparents. Where's the money? Where are the accounts? Who's on the accounts? Who gets the beneficiary? Who has signing privileges on these accounts? Where are the wills? Where's the trust? Where's the living trusts? Uh, is my sister going to be the executor of the trust, or am I going to be the executor of the trust? If she becomes the executor of the trust, I basically have no say. And she could misappropriate the money if she wanted to. Uh, you think that doesn't happen? that family members don't appropriate money, or business partners, or uncles, or aunts, or brothers, or sisters? Hell yes, they do. I've seen it. I manage millions of dollars. I advise people. I see it every single day. People come to me, and I ask them questions, and I, I give them advice. And if they don't do what I give them, the recommendations, they come back to me a year or two later, and they said, Professor Susie, you're right. I really should have done that. I should have done the audit, I should have figured it out, I should have negotiated with my family then, because now basically the assets are held up you know, in probate, because we never got a will, and my sister basically spent a lot of the money that was supposed to go to us, um, and we, we're not going to see the money. We're not going to see the money. So you need to have those conversations um, with your family and with your parents and your grandparents, because you're now adults. And now you have responsibility and accountability, not only for your family, but yourself and your future family and others around you that you're going to be taking care of. So you're probably going to start making some money. And the first thing you're going to probably do is, is have a 401k account. Uh, it may be matching, it may not be matching. This is pre-tax dollars that you're going to contribute into a retirement account that's going to accumulate tax-free until you reach retirement age. And then you're going to pull the money out and they're going to tax you at the income tax level in which you're pulling the money out. And you can start pulling the money out at 59 and a half. But the federal government's going to show up at your doorstep when you turn 70 and a half, and they're going to demand the money. It's going to be a required minimum distribution. And if you put too much money into your retirement accounts, it's going to push you into the highest tax bracket, which, can, which you're going to get hosed on. Or it may push you in the, into the alternative minimum tax, which you're going to get hosed on. So tax planning is extremely important unless you like taxes, and I love taxes. And I'll go over the taxes that I love in a minute. So basically the model is set up where you have this qualified or pre-tax area. Since you're so young, you want to invest in probably equities, okay? Because you have a 30 or 40 year time period. And the equity market, as you know, has returned 8 to 10% per year over the last 30 years. 
So you're probably going to be aggressive because you're so young and you have a long uh, working life. And you're probably going to allocate about 25% of your wealth um, to that bucket. <clears throat> and you can put money into a SEP IRA, about 53,000 bucks a year, self-employed, boom, done. Or you can set up a defined benefit program. Maybe you make too much money and you get a huge real estate deal or you work for a kind of investment bank or you, know, you work for Oracle and they give you stock options and all of a sudden you have a wealth effect. Um, you can set up a defined benefit program and put up to $250,000 pre-tax into the account. You could, in, in eight years, you're done, right? You're done with this side, which means that you're going to be forced into the after-tax realm, which means you're going to pay the taxes and then you have this money and what are you going to do with the money? <coughs> well, which where you put the money is you're probably going to put it in real estate, you're going to put it in businesses, uh, maybe a Roth IRA, stocks, bonds, you know, all after-tax in, in these accounts. And you're probably going to put about 50% of your wealth into that bucket. And then all of a sudden, what's going to happen is the stock options are going to go up, the stock's going to go up, the real estate's going to go up, and your business is going to go through the roof. Now you've got too much money after tax. What do you do with the money? You basically sell off the assets, and you bring them below the line into the safe after tax realm. Safe after tax, California muni bonds. You don't have to pay income tax on the interest at the federal and state level in muni bonds. And because the Bay Area has the highest concentration of wealthy individuals in the United States, we have the biggest muni bond trading desk and portfolio of any place in the United States. Where else do you put the money? Cash value life insurance. You start plowing a bunch of money into there, and you get insurance on yourself and your kids, and you start plowing money into the life insurance. Why? Because when you pull the money out, it's tax-free. The death benefit is tax-free. And you can borrow on the cash value, pull money out, tax-free. How many times did I say tax-free? Three times. Okay. Do you think it's a smart thing to do? Yeah. Who knows about all this stuff? The wealthy. Because they have tax accountants and attorneys that are doing all the planning, and advisors doing the, the planning for them. Who doesn't have it? You guys. You don't have it. You don't have this knowledge. And you will. So how do you accumulate and protect your assets? Because the sad part about it is somebody's going to try to steal your shit. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. You're going to own a business, creditors are going to come after you, and somebody's going to probably slip and fall, or something's going to happen, and you're going to get sued, and they're going to try to take your company away from you. If you're uninsured and you're running a bunch of real estate assets, people are going to, what if that happens if somebody gets shot on the property, or gets killed or maimed? Who are they going to go after first? They're going after you. And the federal government's going to come after you, too. They're already after you. They're going to take your shit, definitely, if you don't plan it correctly. So how do you accumulate and asset protect? Well, the tools are broken down into two toolboxes. you got risk management and you got investment management. On the risk management side, the first thing you get is life insurance. Two to four million dollars of life insurance, and if anything happens to you, it pays off all the debts, pays off the mortgage, you know, your kids get to go to college, your wife gets enough, or her husband has enough wealth, or your family has enough wealth to make sure that they can live at the standard of living or higher than they're accustomed to. And you can actually convert this life insurance into custom whole life, index variable universal life, which actually become investment vehicles to plow money into in a tax advantage manner. And again, if something happens to you, the death benefit, benefit goes to your heirs tax free if you're underneath a 5.32 state tax ceiling, tax free. Um, if your kids aren't going to take care of you when you turn 70, 80 years old, you probably want to look into long-term care insurance. And if you're smart and you have your own business, you can deduct the long-term care insurance premiums through the C Corporation in a pre-tax fashion, which makes it extremely attractive. If you're going to go work for a corporation or you're going to work for a corporation, you're going to be a key person in that company, they're going to put disability insurance on you. Because if you become disabled, that means the revenue of the company is probably going to go down. And if you pass away, there's probably intellectual property in your brain and you probably have a brand and some franchise value to the company that's going to destroy the value of the company. And the company needs to be compensated if something was to happen to you. Either you become disabled or you get killed. Um, you're probably going to need property and casualty insurance on your real estate. Matt 
Stay focused over here. Okay? Stay focused. I'm almost done. Uh, you're probably going to need property casualty insurance if you're going to start to, to own and accumulate real estate. Because what happens if the fire and earthquake hits and you have a $5 million property but you only insured it for $2 million, you got to come up with $3 million to replace the property. And you're probably going to need that money too to be able to service the mortgage on the property because if you go into default, the bank's going to steal your, your property and take it back through. Um, you're also going to need business umbrella insurance. Again, people are going to be coming after you constantly once you become successful, particularly if you're running a business. And you, then you need the insurance company to fight off the creditors and the creditors uh, to sick the attorneys on the, these people and get rid of them, sell or take them out. Um, but they're coming, so you need to be prepared. How are we doing on time? 15 minutes or not on time? Investment management. Qualified, non-qualified, pre-tax, after-tax. Where do you put the money? You get your 401k, you roll it into a self-directed IRA. You can invest in mutual, fund, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, real estate. Now, you can put those in your self-directed IRA. Problem here is these are naked accounts. There's no hedging. There's a, if the market goes down, the value of your retirement account goes down. But what you can do is roll some of that money into a variable annuity or a fixed guaranteed annuity which basically means that the money goes in, it gets invested, and you basically buy for a point of the asset values under management a guaranteed investment protection right. It's basically a long put. So for a point, you buy a put that lasts 12 years. And as the asset values within the portfolio go up, you basically raise and lock in the put. Raise and lock in the put. You do that maybe three times over a 15 or 20 year period, and then at the end when you're done, it lasts for another 12 years. So at any point the market goes down, the insurance company will write you a check for the, the amount that you lost so that you don't lose any principal. Guaranteed. The gar guaranteed fixed uh, future income annuity, I'm 55 years old, I got a million bucks, I give the insurance a uh, million dollars, by the time I'm 75 years old, they, pay, they write me a check every single year for $100,000 for the rest of my life. And if I got it as a joint account, when I go away, my wife gets the $100,000 for the rest of her life. Guaranteed. That way you never uh, run out of money and your standard of living doesn't go down. Because your biggest risk is running out of money. <clears throat> At some point, you're done. Over here. <laughs> now you're forced into the after-tax round. Where do you put the money? Probably going to put some money in a stock brokerage account, maybe in real estate, after tax. Uh, stock brokerage account, I'm going to invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds. It's a highly liquid account, but my, I want my money working for me so that when I need the money for a down payment or education or an M5 or a, whatever kind of car you want, you can liquidate the assets in the account, pay the capital gains, and use the money to buy whatever it is that you need. You can also put money in these variable annuities. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, these variable annuities um, are basically asset protection. So if you ever get sued, they can't go after the assets or the end. It's a veil of protection around the uh, So it locks it in. The variable annuities after tax, rich people love these things because you can plow unlimited amounts of money in these things. There's no limit. And the money accumulates tax-free until you pull it out. And if you die, it goes to your heirs at a step up basis. So people love variable annuities. And if you get sued, they can't come after the income of the assets. You can also put money in these guaranteed future income annuities too. What's great about that is that the 100,000 bucks that you received because you paid for the annuity and after tax dollars, it's on a FIFO basis. So the IRS basically says that a portion of the income that you're receiving is a part of the principal that you put in and you are allowed to deduct up to two thirds of the income tax free. So there's a tax advantage there too. So you've accumulated your wealth. If you stick to the program, you know, I'm a big uh, tortoise and hare uh, story guy. Uh, I don't want to be the hare because I may not get to the finish line. But if I'm a tortoise and I plot it out and plot it out, I'm going to get across the goal line. I'm going to get my four to eight million dollars in the bank by the time I'm 65 years old. If I do it right, if I don't make any mistakes, and if I don't get my shit stolen. So, 
you accumulated this wealth, you have assets outside of a trust. You've signed legal agreements, business interests, real estate interests that basically state in the partnership agreements that you cannot put the assets within a trust. So it's going to sit outside of the trust. And there's probably going to be some kind of mortgage or debt on these assets because they've been levered up. Now here's the problem. You have these assets that are fractional interests in business and real estate that are highly illiquid uh, uh, claims. And you got mortgage on it. If something was to happen to you, usually the heirs will have to pay the taxes on this. Well, do the heirs have money laying around to pay the taxes on the assets when you pass? No. So they'll probably have to liquidate the assets to pay the taxes. Well, since these are such highly illiquid um, instruments, they trade at a deep, deep discount. So what happens is, is you leave your heirs these assets. They have to liquidate them to pay the taxes. There's not enough money to pay the taxes, so you left your heirs a tax liability along with the debt because the sale of these assets may trigger the debt to come due. So you basically left your heirs a liability. You can, if you wholly own the businesses and you wholly own the real estate, you can stick them into what's called an irrevocable trust. Well, the irrevocable trust is awesome because if you pass away, the assets go to your heirs at a stepped up basis. They can sell the assets and not pay any tax. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Grandpa. Nice job. You planned that. So what do you do with these assets? And there might be mortgage and margin on these assets that'll come due when you pass. So you have a tax liability potential mortgage debt liability here, and you have a tax and a debt liability here. So how do you do it? How do you solve the problem? Well, the way you do it is you set up what is called an irrevocable life insurance trust. You get life insurance basically based on the actuarial projections of the mortgage and the tax liability in the future. The trust becomes the beneficiary of the life insurance policy. Yes. I'm sorry to say you're going to have to pay the premiums, and they're probably expensive. So you're going to have to pull some cash from here to pay the premiums on the life insurance policy. But if you pass away, the life insurance policy pays the trust the death benefit, and the death benefit is then used to extinguish the debt, extinguish the debt and the taxes, and all of the assets and go to you debt and tax free. But again, you've got to be healthy and young enough to get the life insurance. If you don't, this is over. Game's over. Do people use this strategy? Hell yes, they do. Yep, the super high net worth, qualified, accredited investors totally understand this. So one of the biggest risks that you're going to confront is taxes. Now, I'll be honest with you, I love taxes. I think taxes are great. I love them. I love income tax. Um, you could be paying between 40 and 70% of your income towards taxes. Love it. Uh, so, oh, don't forget the state and federal and local taxes, too. The state likes to get their hand in the pocket, too, uh, on an annual basis. Uh, recapture tax. You own real estate, you're depreciating your asset, you're going to have to pay the, the, uh, the feds a 25% uh, recapture tax when you sell the property. I love the transfer tax. It's a cute little tax along with Obamacare. Obamacare is probably about 10%, and transfer tax is really, really cute. They're like a little 10%. And then you have retail taxes. Don't forget this. You know, state taxes along with local retail taxes. So there's a lot of taxes here. It's great. I love it. I love taxes. Excellent. I pay all the taxes I can. So to kind of wrap it up, um, first thing you need to do is to make sure that your parents and grandparents and maybe you have a will. Now you're going to be subjected to probate. The government's going to be in your pocket and telling you what to do, and it's going to cost a lot in legal fees. <coughs> You need a medical directive too. Uh, my dad cost us about a million bucks. When he fell ill with leukemia, a million bucks was wiped out. A lot of it was paid by the uh, medical insurance, but again, if he would have lived for another two years, we would have been millions of dollars in debt and wiped us out totally. So the medical director needs to be put in place so that if somebody becomes incapacitated or in a coma, I hate to say it, you can pull the, the trigger on them or pull the plug because they're going to take you and take everybody down in the process. It's a hard decision, but it's reality. Uh, you need a living trust that basically tells where the assets go. You'll circumvent probate. 
by doing it. Um, irrevocable trust, I already talked about that. Oh, here's some great ones here. You're going to love this. The dynasty and the uh, generation skipping trust, this is the best one for you guys. Because this is when your parents and your grandparents call you up and basically say, hey, you guys are so successful, you're not getting any of the money. Your grandkids are going to get it. So we're going to skip over you, and your grandkids are going to get the money. That's good news. Um, and then charitable remainder, you stick the real estate in there. It's worth $5 million, you pull $5 million out. And then when you pass, the asset goes to the charity. And then there are intentionally defective and all kinds of other trusts that you can use to asset protect and transfer wealth tax efficiently and make sure that nobody steals your shit. Finance class, personal finance class. I just gave you the personal finance class in an hour. Okay? Nobody ever taught me this stuff. I had to learn it all myself. Nobody talked about it. Nobody taught me. I just taught you. And hopefully this will be some of the most valuable information that you can take with you to be able to make smart decisions and decisive decisions very well. It's been a great class. Um, I really enjoyed working with all of you. Uh, please look at me as a resource, uh, as an advocate, as an advisor, as a mentor. Tell me what you want, and I'll try to get it for you. In all of my power, I will try to work for you on your best behalf. <clears throat> um, so let me know. Don't be scared to, to ask for help. And I'll do whatever I can to, to get you where you want to go. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to call you up one by one, and you can give me the, uh, the deliverable. Okay. Uh, Evan?